So with that in mind, go back to the passage here. And in this case, let's look at what Paul is saying in light of that. So in verse 8, it begins, what does it say? The word is near you on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. So notice there, Paul can describe his entire gospel as being the word of faith. Right? So for him, the word faith is kind of, in a sense, summarizes the good news that he's sharing with the Romans. Well, what does that mean? Well, he explains, because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, and here that Greek word for believe is pistuo, it's the pistuo, sorry, it's the verbal form of pistis, which is the, the noun, right? So if you believe in your heart, or you faith in your heart, <laughs> example, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All right, so pause there. Notice here, Paul is clearly using the, the verb to believe and the noun faith to talk about an assent to the truth that Christ has indeed been raised from the dead and that he is Lord. But notice that Paul makes sure that it isn't just an intellectual consent, right? It's also verbal expression. So I need to believe in my heart and confess with my lips that Jesus Christ is Lord and he's been raised from the dead. If I do both those things, then I will be saved. So what Paul's trying to do here is express kind of a Jewish, a very, very biblical actually, anthropology, where you don't just focus on the interior or just on the exterior, but on both. And that's really what he's using. The image of the heart is the image of an interior ascent, and then the image of the lips is a symbol of the exterior consent, right? By confessing verbally our assent to the truth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. Now, it's funny here, you'll notice, we might talk about believing in our hearts because we're reflecting the biblical languages, but usually we think of faith as something that takes place in the mind, right? But one of the interesting things is that if you look at the Bible, it will frequently use the image of the heart, not only to describe the seat of the human emotions, but also the intellect, right? So the heart is a very powerful metaphor for, in a sense, the deepest part of the mystery of a person, okay? Um, where a person decides for or against God, that's the heart. It's, it's the innermost secret of the person. And sometimes it's used more to reflect our will, like the choices we make, other times it is used, though, as a symbol for our intellect, okay? So it's just an, it's a biblical way of describing that interior, complete ascent to the truth that Jesus is Lord and that he's been raised from the dead. And then the lips, of course, obviously, are more physical, and they express that outward, public manifestation of inward faith. So here, Paul is saying, if you do both these things, believe in your heart, confess with your lips, you will be saved. And then he explains why in the next verse. For a man believes with his heart, and that's, again, the verb pistuo, he faiths with his heart, and so is justified, or made righteous, or declared righteous. And he confesses with his lips, and so is saved. So this is going to be interesting, too. You'll notice throughout the history of early Christianity, the importance of not just believing, but confessing is going to become very crucial. Now, when we use the word confession in modern-day Catholic circles, we tend to think of it primarily as confessing the bad things that I've done, right? Like the sacrament of confession, which is technically actually the sacrament of reconciliation. We call it the sacrament of confession because that's the part of it we're most scared of, and so we have to we like focus on the confession part. But it's actually the sacrament of reconciliation. So, uh, and that's true because we're using our lips to verbally confess our sins in order to be reconciled. But remember, the word confess was also used in the early church to talk about a public profession of faith, right? So there are certain saints, like Maximus the Confessor, for example, who are called confessors precisely because they were martyred for the sake of the confession of faith. In other words, they were charged to renounce their faith, and they refused to renounce their faith because they confessed that Jesus is Lord, and they were either put to death for it and became martyrs in that way, or like Maximus, had his tongue cut out. Right? And so he's called the confessor because he refused to renounce the faith verbally 
in a public way. So here Paul is, again, talking about making the confession of faith and a belief in the heart in order to be justified and to be saved. Now, why are both those things necessary? Well, remember, Paul is a Jew, right? He's a Jewish believer in Christ, and so he's going to cite the Jewish scriptures as a foundation for his emphasis on the necessity of both um, believing, faith, right, but also confessing. So uh, the scripture says here in verse 11, he quotes the scripture, and he's quoting from Isaiah, no one who believes in him shall be put to shame. And then he keeps going, for there is no distinction between Jew or Greek the same Lord is Lord of all and bestows his riches upon all who call upon him. And then he quotes a second scripture. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So here he's quoting Joel chapter 2 and Isaiah 28. So the first quote is from Isaiah 28, 16. The second quote is from Joel 2, 32. And what he's saying is, if you look at the Jewish scriptures, you look at the Old Testament, the prophets reveal that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, that's with the lips, right, will be heard. And whoever believes, right, with the heart will be saved. And those are the foundations for Paul's emphasis on both faith and the confession of faith, right, with the lips. And what Paul's saying here, this is important. Notice he says, because there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, the same Lord is Lord of all. Now, why does he say that? Well, because the context of the letter to the Romans that he's writing about is wrestling with this question of the relationship between Jews and Gentiles in Christ. And you'll probably recall from other videos that Paul was called by God to go not exclusively to the Jewish, to the Gentile people, but predominantly or primarily, right? So he's sent out to the nations. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. And whenever he would get to a city in the book of Acts, he would always go to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. But he clearly has a special vocation to go to the nations. And so as he's building churches throughout the Mediterranean that consist predominantly of Gentiles, but not exclusively of Gentiles, there will be Jewish converts to, um, to the gospel. One of the things that happens is in these congregations where you have lots of Gentiles and in some cases fewer Jews, it's not always the case, it's a mixed congregation of Jews and Gentiles, the question of priority, uh, status, relationship within the body of Christ between these Jews and Gentiles, Jews and Gentiles is going to be a problem. It's going to be, oh, it's going to be a source of some conflict, a source of tension, but also raising just questions. What's the relationship between the Old and New Testament? What's the relationship between Jew and Gentile? W which promises of the Old Testament continue to be binding on Jews? Are they all binding on Gentiles? Like, for example, circumcision, you know, the practice of circumcision in the book of Genesis. So all that's being worked out. And what Paul's trying to emphasis, emphasize here and this is important for us today, is it doesn't matter what ethnicity you are. It doesn't matter what race you come from, what people you come from, what continent you hail from, right? Whether you're a Jew of the people of Israel or you're a Gentile, meaning belonging to every other nation in the world, Christ is the Lord of all. He's the, the same Lord. So everyone, Jew or Gentile, which is a very first century Jewish way of saying, all of humanity is called to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, right? To believe that he has been raised from the dead and that he is the Son of God. In other words, in order for anyone to be saved, they have to come to faith in Jesus Christ and confess him as Lord. So Paul is emphasizing not just the necessity of faith, but the universality of it, right? This faith is for all people. And that's something he's going to really have to stress in a first century Roman context because you had all these different deities, these gods and goddesses. You had lots of local deities. You had certain kings setting themselves up as divine kings, the divine Caesars. There's a whole cornucopia of different cults from the East and the West and local deities and local shrines. There's so much variety on display when it comes to um, the kinds of religious worship as well as different beliefs about the afterlife and different gods and goddesses in that first century context. And so what Paul is saying is, look, 
whether you're Jew or Gentile, Christ Jesus is the Lord of all humanity. He's the Lord of all people. And belief in him is necessary for salvation. And not just belief, but confession. But in other words, uh, outward affirmation, outward profession of his lordship in order to be saved.